Okay, so hi everybody, I'm Trevor Sherwin. Let's do this again. Um, we're here at GTA Imaging here in Toronto, Canada, and we are basically gonna be talking about how to run a successful photography business. I run one, Provocateur Images, which is my boudoir photography business, but I also run a training business, which is phototraining.ca. I mean, I do workshops here in Toronto for all sorts of people who want to attend, but, um, but you know, also we, we talk about business related stuff. We don't just have models through the work, through the uh, studio and that's it. There's so much more I do. So today, I mean, we got a good group in here. Uh, everybody here, I presume is, well, you're a photographer of sorts, right? Who, can I just get a raise of hands? I just want to see who is doing this full time. Wow, so like right up the front here. These are my full timers here. Uh, everybody else is doing this as a part time kind of thing. Looking to go full time? Yeah, like is there, this is, like I saw, I asked like looking to go full time and somebody just went like just dead. No head movement whatsoever. So I was trying to figure this out. Um, so I guess a little bit about me. Uh, I've been taking pictures for a really long time. It's, uh, it's almost, what are we, 2017? Let's call it about 17 or 18 years. Um, I've been shooting professionally where it's the means that which I feed myself for about three. I've always worked in the photo industry. I've worked in retail stores. I've managed retail stores. I've, I don't know, I've worked on the distribution side, all sorts of things. So in essence, I've kind of run little businesses um, if you think of a photo store as a little business, I mean, it was a corporate store, but I still had to be responsible for all the stuff that went on there. But, um, you know, I, what, I, what I bring is kind of uh, a look into what somebody has done to transition from the, I guess, working part-time at this, just kind of dabbling in it, to moving to a full-time career as a photographer. And that's what I'm hoping to give you guys some tips on, right? Um, I guess uh, first thing is I would like to thank GTA Imaging for hosting this. Um, GTA Imaging and I really want to kind of help make this, like I guess make the photo community a little bit stronger, especially for photographers. Um, GTA Imaging is a lab here in Toronto and Mike, let's go uh, next slide. Um, basically what we're what we're all about is trying to make you guys realize that there's money to be made as photographers and good money to be made. But um, I think that by helping you and educating you, we can help show you that how to make the money. So we've got uh, running a successful photography business tonight. We're going to be here for about an hour and a half, two hours um, with some breaks. And on May 17th, uh, it'll be marketing your photography. And the last one on May 31st is gonna be in-person sales. Um, I'll be doing all three of these. And I gotta tell you, um, I love, I mean, running a successful photo business is just like the starting point, kind of gets a lot of people like, oh, that's a good idea, I should do that. And then the other two are like, wow, that's how, so I hope to see more for all of those. Um, so let's, uh, let's get started, shall we? I'm gonna ask you a slightly rhetorical and slightly facetious question. And I wanna hear from you guys in the crowd. What does every business need to do at the most fundamental level? Make money. Thank you, make money. I've heard all sorts of answers with this. I've heard, um, please your customers. I've heard, offer the best service possible. No. Before that, a business needs to make money and turn a profit. And it's not, because there's a big difference between having $100,000 in annual sales and having none of that $100,000 for yourself. Okay? That's what we call uh, no profit. <laughs> not, not for profit, that's no profit. And that's not what you want. You have to make money. So I'm going to come back to that point a little later and... For right now, I just want to dispel a few myths for those of you thinking about pursuing this as more of a full-time career. And that is, what do you need, what skill sets do you need to have if you want to be a photographer? I've listed a few. So I've got, you know, things like you got to be a web designer. 
And if you don't know how to do that, you better find someone. But your website is basically your calling card to the world, and it's what people are going to do to measure you against the next photographer. So you're going to have to know quite a bit about web design. You're going to have to be a blogger and a writer, and I hate this aspect. I am not a writer. I don't want to be a writer. I, I know if I lived in the 18th century, the one thing I would not be is a poet. Positive of that. I know I wouldn't because I hate words. I like speaking them, but I don't like writing them down. I sound like a six-year-old when I write blog posts. But I work around that. So you got to be a social media specialist these days too. Honestly, like, I mean, if you're not on Instagram very aggressively, you're going to have problems. If you're not using Facebook, you're not on Twitter, you're not doing all these things to get your word and name out there, you're going to have a problem. And social media goes past just the, the basic, the standard issue social media channels. I'm also talking about being a little bit of a specialist in email marketing with like things like MailChimp or uh, Constant Contact and things like that. There are other social media platforms that you also will need to invest time into. I think you got to be a bit of an SEO guru. And SEO just stands for search engine optimization. This ties back to being a web designer. You can need to be an editor retoucher, obviously. Like, look, no, can no image comes out of a camera perfectly. You know, you've always got to add your little flair to it. No, and I'm not talking the lens flare under the Photoshop filter pull down menu. Like, don't, don't add that kind of flare. But salesperson, accountant, other big one, marketing ninja. And I, I say ninja facetiously simply because I think you got to figure out ways of marketing your business to get yourself out there. I mean, if you don't have, you know, a marketing budget of $20,000 a year, you got to figure out how to make $2,000 a year or $200 a year stretch. So you got to figure out how you're going to use your marketing skills to do things. And of course, you also have to be an analyst. And the reason I say analyst and last is because for everything you do, you have to analyze what you do. If you run a marketing campaign, say it's a Facebook ad, you have to analyze how well it did. You don't just, oh, I'm doing my Facebook ad today. It's going to run for this time to this time. If you simply just do that, let it run its course and never look at it again, how are you going to know for the next time if you did it right or if you did it wrong? So I say analyzation is extremely important. If you didn't get the job, you know, like let's say you're bidding on a commercial contract. If you didn't get that job, why didn't you get that job? It's really important for you to make sure you analyze what you do on a pretty critical level because I think it's extremely important. I think it's something people tend to overlook. And I guess the little joking statement at the end there, you probably need to know what an aperture is too. Because honestly, there is a ton of people in the world that, you know, they, they, they got great exposure mechanics and they take really good pictures, but they kind of fall flat on their face because they don't know how to market their business and they don't know how to go out and get that business. And that's really what uh, I want to teach you today. So let's go to the next part. I listed all those things on screen because I want you to think that being a photographer doesn't mean hanging out at the studio or being on location, working five hours a week, throwing your camera over the back and going, oh, I'll buy a new Hasselblad tomorrow. And, you know, then going to your private island you own in the Caymans or something like that. That doesn't happen. So you are going to spend probably 90 to 95% of your time <laughs> not taking pictures. Whether that be time chewed up in editing, or marketing yourself, or blogging, or writing. I don't care what it is, but you're going to spend more time doing other stuff than taking pictures. So you treat take the times you do get to take pictures as a special treat away from your desk, which photographers hate to say it. You get trapped behind a desk a lot. Don't think it's not the office desk job. You get more flexibility, like you can go work in coffee shops, which is kind of cool. But it is a desk job. So there's a lot of stuff that you got to do there. And if you don't know how to do something, do not be a control freak. I know way too many photographers, and even to some degree myself included, 
that get a little like, oh no, I could never let somebody do that for me. I like doing that, or I need to do that. I could never trust somebody. No, I think you need to be able to give some stuff up. So if you don't know how to write like me, you hand that off and you maybe trade for services. Like find yourself a writer and if they need headshots done or they need something, trade for services. May not be a long-term solution, but it's an idea. Um, if you don't have time to do your edits, there's all sorts of places you can outsource your editing to. So there's lots of different ways of outsourcing and delegation. But use it, because the last thing you want to do is just sit behind a desk all the time for more than 40 hours a week. Um, so let's go to the next point here. And that is invest. You gotta, you gotta remember that as, as photography grows and changes, um, it, you, you have to invest in your craft. And I think we're, the, the point I guess I will make is that don't just invest in the mechanical side of things. Like if somebody wants to teach you how better to shoot shallow depth of field, like if that's really relevant to your business, fine, take that course but also look at what else you can do and the, the kind of business craft of it. Look at how, invest in time for how to run a drip campaign in MailChimp. If you don't know what that is, too bad. I, <laughs> I don't have time to get into that, but I'm just using that as an example. It's email marketing, uh, whereby basically if somebody signs up for say your newsletter, it automatically sends them a whole sequence of emails based on certain criteria and it does it all automatically so you look like you're super on top of them and like, yay, gung-ho, I'm gonna sell to you and you've done sweet nothing when they finally sign up. It's all automated. That's what a drip campaign is. It's awesome and there's great resources out there but I've gone out and I've looked at those resources, frustrated myself a little bit but eventually learned it. And so don't think that just being a better photographer technically is going to get you more work. I don't think that's completely and honestly the best way to look at it. I think you need to look at all the other stuff that goes into photography and being a photographer that will make you a more successful photographer. So let's go to the next point. And I got three keys that I wanna talk about today. First one is knowing your customer. Second one is specializing. And then the third is pricing for success. Are these the only three keys to success? Oh, please, no. There are way more. This is just what we're talking about tonight. All right, so there is way more that we do. And um, I guess I should point out that this little presentation I'm doing is kind of an excerpt from what I do with my business mentoring program. Because I do this with photographers both locally and all over the place. Um, and it's, it's basically something that I found uh, an interesting little avenue for to, to help people get going. Because ultimately, um, I'd like to help photographers s not be the lowest common denominator and you know just kind of undercut the industry. I'd love to get people to be more successful and charge what they should. So this business mentoring program goes through so much more than what we're doing here today. This is like a 10% if that scratch the surface of some of this. Um, so aside from that, let's go to the next thing because I want to talk about your clients. I, I'm very curious, especially for everyone in the room. Like, who, like let me just see your show of hands. Who really can, it, can tell me who their customer is? Like they could describe to me in pretty good detail who their customer is. Could anybody do that? Just let you, Lou. Tell me about your. Tell me about a customer of yours. Well, a, a really good customer of mine is actually a uh, uh, ad agency um, does content for uh, um, Amazon and. Uh, eBay and all that, and I provide images that help sell for their customers to sell on Amazon and eBay. Okay, so you've got an ad agency customer and you do the images for them. Okay, so that's one customer, but 
I think I'm going down the route of, describe to me a profile of like a generic customer. And I think what you need to do is you need to think about who your customer really truly is. Like if you're a wedding photographer, you could take the cop out excuse and go, my customer is a bride. Uh, no, I think you could get a little bit more granular than that. I think you could say, maybe my bride is someone who is looking for more of an editorial style uh, look to the, to the wedding, doesn't really want the photographer, um, doesn't want to give the photographer a shot list, they want to just have the photographer run independently, grab me and the groom when, we need, when they need them, and you know, like that, that's kind of, that kind of thing. I can't explain a bridal client because I don't shoot weddings ever for any amount of money. So if you're a wedding photographer, I promise you, I'm not your competition. Um, but the reason I ask you who your client is, and please understand that your client is, there's not necessarily just one of them. I have probably about five or six very distinct profiles for customers. And the reason I have these profiles for people is so that I can develop marketing that speaks to them. And I think this is so important. And it's a painful process. I know there's one person in the room who has done this with me, and they will remain nameless for now. But um, I remember how like, ah, oh, really, you want more detail? Seriously? Like, it was, it was a hard process to actually think of who they are. So. Let's just look at one of my examples. So I'm just, I'm just literally, I'm just going to read this word for word. Um, and this is a generic profile, remember. So this is uh, 35 to 55 and is generally going through a milestone time in life that could be anything from weight loss to separation and a new point of life. Generally, this is someone uh, doing something like this for themselves and they, to, or to get their sexy back after having children. They will have many more hangups about their body and have the idea that they should still look the way they did when they were 25. And they usually have trouble splurging on themselves, but will do so uh, when they see a themselves in a more positive light. And overcoming the fear of body acceptance will be the hardest part. Now remember, I am a boudoir photographer. This is what I do. This is my milestone customer, or what I term my milestone customer. So when I am creating marketing material that I want to appeal to this person, I have this written on a whiteboard above my desk. And there's one for each of my different categories. And then I look at whatever marketing pitch I'm selling or like let's say I'm putting something on sale and who do I want to have it appeal to. You know, I look at the imagery associated with it. Does it match what this person probably looks like themselves? That's number one. Number two, does the verbiage say, do this for you? Don't worry about them, meaning husband or significant other. Do it for you. You know, there is no measurement that, is, that defines sexy. Sexy is up here. So just to give you a few ideas of how I would speak to them. And that will then resonate with them far better. I'm seeing a few heads go, aha, uh -huh. good. So this is an important step that you guys are gonna have to take in order to, um, to get yourself to that next level of being hired by the clients you want. Now, I mean, I know everybody's different. I'm sure some of us in here probably shoot products, some of us shoot weddings, some of us shoot kids and babies and dogs and cats and rocks on the ground and the sky and all sorts of, I'm sure there's a million different genres of photography in here, but you can ultimately figure out who your customer is. The sooner you can figure that out, the sooner you can actually sell to them. Does that make sense? Okay. Who is, who feels they're doing this? To a degree, you say. Okay, so that's, that's good. Like it, but has anybody ever told you to do that exercise? 
I see, I see stairs looking at me like, oh my God, I should have been doing this. And then when I asked the question, I was hoping for this. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is an exercise that I think is very, very, very beneficial because not only do you have to define your own photography business and your brand, but you have to define who your client is. And believe it or not, when you go through an exercise like this, you become so focused. It's like you almost carve out a niche of a niche. Like you, you really do specialize. And I mean, you know, like I guess, I guess you could say that even portraits, like if I was just to take portraits as an example, um, this is an area where you could be very specialized. Like there are people out there shooting who some of them may shoot, they may say I'm a portrait photographer, but what they do is they shoot just actor headshots. You know, like they're, they just cater to that. And they might even specialize even more going to comedic actor headshots. You know, if it's bridal, they could, I shoot weddings, but I, I only shoot uh, at, at venues that are absurd and somebody who's got a budget of a lot of money. Um, you know, but I, but I deliver a certain style that people want. I shoot this all editorial looking. And you know, like you have, and, but you have this very defined category of what you do. And by going through this exercise, I promise you, you're going to find that group of customers. And as I said, I got about five or six of them just specific to boudoir. So there's a, a few, there's one for couples, um, three for women, one for men. And you know, like that's basically what I've got. So if I want to generate any marketing or advertising or anything like that, I can compare against my groups and say, does this appeal to them? Does this appeal to them? You know, and that makes a huge difference in the impact of that ad. Because I don't think anybody wants to just take the carpet bomb, bomb approach where it's like, okay, well, I'll run a Facebook ad. Um, show it to zillions of people. You know, because if you think about Facebook, it actually is really targeted for advertising. So you could use that to your advantage. And if you know who your customer is, you could really specify it. It's not just who has the most money. Because believe me, people who you think might not have a lot of money to spend on your services will spend the money on your services. Never underestimate that. Do not think that it's only people in the living in the well, I was going to say million dollar homes in Toronto, but that's now every home. <laughs> but um, we'll say in the 20 million dollar homes, you know, don't think that it's, you, you need to target that postal code for where you run your ad. You know, you want to run your ad that showcases what you do to your client. And your client is going to be different. Like if we did the same thing, your client's probably going to be different than mine. And because your photography is different than mine, right? We all see things through our lenses differently and we do things differently. Just because you shoot the same genre as somebody else does not mean there's an equal comparison there. If somebody loves your work, they will book with you, okay? So let's do that, let's go to the next point. And this comes to me, this, this like the last thing I said is if people love what you do, they will book you. So you wanna resonate with those clients. You want to be like so good that they just can't go, oh, no, I could settle for the other person, uh, but I don't want to. You know, like you want, at the very least, you want that decision for them to, if they went anywhere else, you want to be the primary choice and that anybody else they choose is solely based on some other criteria, like they live closer or they are just so much cheaper and I, ha I can't afford I don't know, $5,000, I, I can afford 500 bucks, right? Like I'm just, I love that work, but I, I literally can't afford it. But that's, if you resonate with them, I want you guys to be top of the list for when somebody is making that comparison. You may not get the job every time, but what's gonna happen is you become the basis point for comparison because your marketing spoke to them in a way that was just so like, oh my God, this is exactly what I want to do. That's who I want photographing me. I want you guys to be that. And that's powerful. 
because all of a sudden price becomes less of an issue. You could be, you know, if your product was, I don't know, $8,000 and the next person down was say $7,000, they would actually spend $1,000 more because you resonated with them. And that's not, that goes above and beyond just you meeting with them, interacting and just being awesome and getting the job that way. I'm talking about just that face value, what they see without even, you know, picking up the phone and calling you. Just with the marketing you put out, your website, all of that. So let's talk about the next little thing here. So really, at the end of the day, what makes you different? I mean, we're all taking pictures here, right? There's no difference, is there? I'd argue, uh, heck yes. There's absolutely a difference between any one of us, even if we're shooting the same thing. Not only does um, the, the things look different aesthetically from the way some people shoot it. I mean, I know people who love their 2470 for boudoir um, as a comparison to me. I love my 35 and I love my 85. That's just me. I mean, I don't usually shoot with anything other than those two lenses. I might pull out a 50 every now and again. I might grab my 135, but primarily it's 35 and 85 for me. So my, the way I visually show something is gonna be different than somebody who's shooting with a 2470. If you even wanna just take it down to mechanical stuff, let alone where you're physically planted, how you pose somebody, how you interact with somebody, it's all different. And sometimes that's a little bit hard to show on a website, but people will just know it when they see it. So really, what, what else makes you different as photographers? Think about it. What makes you different? I, you, I hear in the back, personality. That's huge. There are some, there are some people who just have a natural charm. That's, and some people are a little bit quieter and some people are a little bit more rambunctious. And sometimes that resonates different ways with different people. But you're, you gotta have some charm, you gotta have some swagger, you gotta be a little, you gotta be confident. You can't just be like, well, I think I can do that. That's, that's not very reassuring. Um, but you gotta, you gotta have some swagger and some confidence. Um, but ultimately, um, what makes you different is how you approach approach the way you value your craft and how you market yourself and how you talk to people. So let's look at the next point I got here. So this is, this is the end of know your customer. I want you to figure out, go home, like really think about this. Think about who your customers are. And I'm not talking, and they have to be fictitious people. They can't be like, I have this, this client XYZ over here that I deal with a lot. That's not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for, I'm asking for that fictitious person that you can measure things against, that you, can, that you can use as a template for talking to other people like that person. You know, and that may be, that may be like if you're a wedding photographer, that could be the bride, if that's the you know, if that's the, uh, like if you do kid portraits, that might be the mom or the dad. You know, like, let's, actually, let's dig into portrait, like family portraits for a second. Like, there might be a, uh, like you may do one customer type, which is the mom, as the obvious choice. And, you know, like they, she's, she's got younger kids, because, let's face it, I, any, who's, who's a parent in the room, by the way? Got a few parents in the room, okay. How many of you have more than one child? Okay, uh, just curious now, uh, your second child, were there more or less photos taken of the second child? Less, less right? You also realize they're like from the first one who you like handled so carefully, the, the second one you're like, oh yeah, just run down the stairs, I don't care. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's uh, you know, so like a lot of times like the original customer might be they might have the first child this is a really big experience this is like something you want to capture they're young they're fun <laughs> then they're going to turn into like kids and you'll hate them um but like that's that's maybe your first person maybe you also have a second one a little bit more out there but maybe it's a dad it's a 
dad who doesn't get to see his kids very often, right? So you could come up with a marketing campaign so to say when the dad's got the kids, you know, and you, you want some great pictures at home of you and your kids, maybe that's a customer profile you want, right? And you could really put a very interesting heartfelt thing on that. And seriously, how many portrait photographers are marketing to dads? Probably none. Niche of a niche of a niche maybe, right? Like it's it, like you, I'm just asking you to think a little bit. Um, because the more you think about this for your homework, I think the happier you're going to be. Okay? So create more than one customer profile too. Have you guys got any questions about customer profiles? This is like the quietest group ever. <laughs> um, when you're dealing with portraits or you're dealing with individuals, it's easy to create a client profile right? mm -hmm. because you're profiling your clients. When you're doing products <coughs> or landscapes and stuff, who and how could you create a profile for that? So the question is, is so when you're dealing with individuals like business to consumer, it's easy to create a profile. And I agree, definitely easier. But when you're doing, say, B2B or like business to business or something that's not as identifiable as a, as a finished customer, um, it's a little harder. Yes, maybe, but like you, you say products, right? Okay, so let's say, what kind of products do you shoot? Uh, wine, uh, beer, food, that kind of stuff. Okay, food, so you... Food, food you can attract to a certain individual, a type mm -hmm. of individual who likes, if you're shooting cheese, you're doing cheese, you can approach somebody that's cheese, that mm -hmm. likes cheese. You're not gonna hit a lactose intolerant person, but... <laughs> True, so like, yeah, you're, if you're, you're, shoot, you're, you're shooting uh, food and beverage kind of things, um, like who might your customer be? Well, I would look at that as like, okay, so um, I'd be looking at somebody who's obviously selling that kind of stuff. And being here in Ontario and being about an hour away from wine country for us, um, maybe six hours in traffic, but you know, like an hour, let's say, at, under optimal situations, there are all sorts of wineries down there. So if you have an amazing portfolio, you can walk in, maybe create an info package, drop that off with them and say, hey, look, you're gonna need photography. Look, they might do it themselves, but they might not. You might also wanna hit up their website ahead of time. And if their stuff sucks, <laughs> you might wanna, there's an opportunity. But like if somebody had already amazing photos, you're gonna like, okay, I will still drop an info package off, but I probably won't, or I might not get this job. You never know, because let's say they just had a falling out with their last photographer. You never know, right? Exactly. So, but at least by dropping off something, and when I say an info package, uh, one of the great things that GTA Imaging helped me with is they have, um, they have these eight by 10 proof boxes. They're, um, I mean, I know for video land, this is gonna be tough to see. This is one of my album boxes, it's huge. Imagine this as an eight by 10 box, only about, how thick are they, Andy? About a half inch? About a half inch thick. Um, but I have my Provocateur Images logo stamped on it. Of course, it's oriented this way. And inside, I have my info guide, which was done here. And it costs not a lot per, Per book. I mean, it worked out to a few dollars a book. And then I have a separate insert page that I print off. I have to trim it to 8 by 10 because I just print that on my printer at home. But it's got what's in, involved in my, uh, like what I do. And it's a customized letter to them with a business card in there. And those proof boxes are like, they're simple boxes. Like they're not that thick. But when I give those to people, the response I get is like mind blowing. Like it's a $5 box. <laughs> but they think it, it costs me thousands of dollars to make this for them. So you could approach a business like that. And I mean, there's all sorts of little, like, I mean, you have to kind of find the source for say cheese or wine or something like that. Like you're not necessarily gonna have a lot of success going into a big corporate set center like the LCBO and selling your photo services to them. 
but you could approach the originator, mm -hmm. like the original distiller, brewmaster, vinter, all that kind of stuff. So there's lots of opportunity. You just have to figure out where to find them. Does that kind of give you an idea for B2B? Yeah, from a profile perspective, you really can't with products. It's more of here's your products, try to compare it to what they already have, and then create the info package. You can't really create that woman, that milestone woman you set up. No, but you could create at least a broad profile of just saying, okay, here's my package for distillers, right? Small microbrewery. Right. Ex IPAs or whatever, and that's who I want to target. Right. It's a unique bottle. So, product. like, it's not a person. It doesn't have to be a person, but it does have to be a little profile. It's, like, semi-malleable, but it's there. Wouldn't you be working with agencies, though, with somebody who's doing that kind of photography? Could be doing an agency yeah. as well. So the point was also made, like, could you not also work with agencies? And that's absolutely. Sure. So there's, like, there's profile. Like, even, like, even though they're kind of final destinations for things, they are kind of profiles in a way. So they're, they're the same yet different. Uh, do we have any questions on the board? <laughs> okay. Yeah, and guys, if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're listening live, I mean, make sure to ask the questions. There's a little fancy box there. You type stuff in, you hit send. It's kind of like text messaging. Um, it's kind of fun. Try it. Uh, but let's go on to the next segment. All right. Let's talk about being a specialist. I think that... I guess I've looked at a lot of photographers who have started out, you know, they're very good at like an aperture. When the number's big, it's like this. When it's small, it's like this. Shutter speed, fast one, freezes stuff, slow one, blurs stuff. But, you know, and then they start shooting everything and anything. And we've all been there. Look, I don't know where all of you exactly are in the room, and I'm not trying to poke fun at anybody. I'm just saying, like, we've all been there. But if you are trying to market yourself, it's really tough to do that when you shoot everything. When you shoot dogs, cats, um, people, kids, infants, I'm looking around the room here for cars, landscapes, you know, balloons, I, I don't know. Like you shoot everything and you, you, you have on your website everything, you know, when somebody looks at your site, they're going to go, uh, what does this person really do? Right? I think, I think you need to, to be successful as, a, as an independent photographer. I think you have to specialize in something. And, you know, I've chosen to specialize in, in boudoir. Now, if somebody, one of my clients comes to me and says, hey, can you do some family portraits? I'm not going to say no. I'm just not going to put it on my website. Right? It's not part of my core business. Just as, you know, you look at, um, you sometimes look at companies like, maybe they make soft drinks. Like if Mountain Dew made a cola tomorrow, not that you, well, I should be careful. I shouldn't say you wouldn't want to drink Mountain Dew, but you wouldn't want to drink Mountain Dew. Um, you know, like if they made something completely out in left field, you know, it's going to be really hard for them to market it because all their marketing exists over here. So, why do that as a photographer? I mean, you want to try to find genres that match. Like, listen, if, you, if you're a wedding photographer and you want to shoot engagement sessions, that makes sense. It's like right next to each other. They're very logically connected. But if you want to be a wedding photographer and then shoot, I don't know, drag racing, eh, it's a stretch, <laughs> to say the least, right? So you might want to think about being more specialized in something is my point. So let's look at the next point I got here. I've, I've kind of drawn up this very rudimentary chart. It's, it's basically here just to show you how I kind of look at what I do. Um, so I've got boudoir in the center, and it's kind of a broad generic term, because there's, there's sub-genres of boudoir, and I kind of have them off to the side. So you got, maybe on the left side, you got glamour, uh, bridal boudoir, maternity boudoir, like kind of beauty falls off that, like for somebody who's like, okay, well, in my underwear, mm, no, but in a nice dress, yes, 
right? So like, you know, there's, there's logical connection to there and then fine art nudes, but as you start going further away from your core strength, you start running into a problem where you're not gonna be able to market to those people based on your current customer profile, right? You're gonna have a lot of trouble doing that. So, you know, like I'll use, a, I'll use an extreme example. So you can see down at the bottom left, you have erotic portraits, uh, which, you know, could I guess stem off of fine art nudes. Um, and then you have, up on the top right, you have child portraits. Um, probably not something you want to put on the same website, right? Just saying. But um, definitely not blended. That's, that's for damn sure. That's, that'd be a really bad idea. Um, so, you know, like you've got these things on there. And, and like, I mean, I want you to think about what you do. I mean, if you, if you love the idea of being like, okay, well, I shoot uh, pet portraits and I shoot weddings, well, and you want to put it on the same website, maybe, just maybe, you might want to get two different domain names for that. You still run one company from a billing perspective, but you might want to have messaging that speaks to this from, a, you know, like from when you post on Instagram, and then this for when you have another Instagram account, and different website, and things like that. I just think it would make more sense. It would also help really streamline things for customers. Because when they look at you and they start seeing like, oh, that's what they do. I think that being a specialist gives you extra street cred. Well, not street cred, but credibility. Street cred is different. You got to earn that, right? So let's, uh, let's look at the next slide here. And I say it's all about your message. So if you know who your customer is and you are going to speak to them, you're gonna have a very concise marketing message that you'll eventually deliver to them. You're also going to tailor your blog posts that speak to them. And because you're a specialist, you're gonna have that specialized, very targeted type of approach so that when they see this, they're just going, yeah, 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 that makes total sense. Obviously, you have to get it in front of their eyes, but the most successful photographers I think I've seen are the ones that do specialize. I want you guys to think about, think for a second, like there's a lot of photographers out there, you know, we see them online, um, you know, like just name me a famous photographer that's out there right now that you might see on something like Creative Live and tell me what they do. Sue Bryce, Sue Bryce what does she do? Beauty and glamour, right? Who else? Jared Jonas. Jared Jonas, what does he do? Weddings. High end weddings. High end weddings. Chris Brockhart. Chris Brockhart, what does he do? Landscapes. Landscapes. And some outdoor. kind of outdoor action adventure -y kind of stuff. Who else? Who else you got? Art Wolf. Art Wolf. There's a name I haven't heard. <laughs> What's he do? He does landscapes. Oh, he's landscapes, okay. Yeah, you got Peter Hurley, right? Yep, Peter Hurley. Headshots, ah, but not just any headshots usually. Usually the headshots that involve more like actors and stuff like that, like Annie Leibovitz. Heard of her? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Never heard of this magazine called Vanity Fair. <laughs> no, but you know, she shoots these very over the top type of portraits, right? Like, but if you think about it, they all do something very specific, don't they? So if you look at other photographers who've had a great deal of success, they do specialize. They may do other kinds of jobs, but for the most part, they're specialists in a very specific genre. And I mean, yes, I'm sure any of the people we mentioned could probably do something else in the other person's field, but they probably don't want to go out and try to market themselves that way, do they? They want to focus on what they do. I'm trying to get you guys to think about being focused, right? So when you start thinking about, if you're a specialist, think about how much better or how much more this thing we call Google will like you, right? Google 
as a search engine looks at your site and it says, hmm, what do they do? And it'll look at the image tags you have on there, the, the copy on your text, you know, what's bolded, what's not, headings, all sorts of things. Like there'll be all, any number of things Google will look at and that algorithm is so insanely protected that nobody knows. And it's basically what we call voodoo or dark art. <laughs> but the one thing I can tell you is if your website is very tailored to a specific type of photography and you will probably start ranking much higher on Google than if you have a domain that has dogs, cats, landscapes, porcupines and roadkill and stuff like that. Like it's, you, you, if you're focused and what you do is weddings in Toronto or in Oshawa or in Kitchener, like the more focused you are and the more times that comes up on your site, the more Google goes, hmm, when somebody searches Toronto boudoir photographer, it's no secret why I come up really high in the rankings. I'm not paying some SEO company to do this. I'm doing it myself by simply just having good SEO practices. But by having a very targeted, specific, specialized genre of photography, it's really easy for me to do that on my site. So that's one of the reasons why being a specialist can really, really help. Um, I think if you're specialized, your promo materials, one, you'll need way less of them because you won't need a portfolio for the dogs and cats. You won't need one for people. You won't need one for weddings. You won't need one for couples portraits. Like, you know, like yeah, I got about six portfolios, but I didn't do them all at once, right? Like, you don't need a ton of them. You, you got a specific message. And what's worse than having somebody flip through a portfolio and it's like, oh, that's cool, that's cool. What is this? Like, why is this here? And then, you know, like it just kind of feels disjointed. When you're a specialist, you just have this focus. And of course, that plays in with samples. And lastly, pricing is the other thing that when you're a specialist, it's really, really easy. Because you don't need four different price lists. I mean, look, you may have different ones. Like if you have a business that approaches consumers, you might have a consumer price list and you might have a price list for dealing business to business, right? I'm not saying you won't have multiple price lists, but you won't have 15 of them, right? So it's a little easier to manage that way. And you can have a very concise pricing message too, all right? So uh, let's just move to the next point. And this is, as you're, when you're a specialist, you need to, this kind of plays in with that resonating with customers. This is show them what they want to see. I think this is super important. I, I've, you know, when I've been, as when I started doing this business mentoring thing, um, you know, it was kind of by accident. It was just a photographer that asked me for help and I said, yeah, sure, let's, let's do it. Um, I charged them for it because I don't work for free. But, you know, when I looked at their website, I, the first thing I saw was like, who's your customer? Like after we went through the exercise of going through who's the customer in like really great detail, I said, compare what we wrote here with what you see there on your site. Like, does it match? And they go, no. I said, well, why are these images here? So we went through, we just started tossing images like that one can stay, that, 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 that's got to go. And then what did they do? They went out and they started doing some creatives for work that would showcase what they do for their client. So show them what they want to see. I'll give you a great example of where I could fail miserably if I wasn't careful. I could go out and I could take pictures of what, you know, society would tell us is a really beautiful woman, which I can't stand that <coughs> label, like where everybody has to be a size two or less and they have to fit this sort of frame and no, no. I, I think that's complete and other BS to, to the nth degree. Everybody is beautiful and what everybody needs to see 
is themselves portrayed in that way. I, weekly, at Reveals, all I, all I, my, like the thing that I love the most about Reveals is when somebody comes in and goes, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> like, whoa, not in a bad way, but they're like, their brain is like going, I'm not used to looking like that, but I look, oh my God, I would spank my own bum. Like, this is amazing. This is, wow. You know, like, I, I mean, I, I very rarely do meetings at coffee shops, but I had to do one for uh, one client because uh, she was kind of out of town, so I kind of met her halfway. So we're in a Starbucks in Mississauga somewhere. And, um, you know, as we're flipping through the pictures, she goes, oh my God, look at my bum. <laughs> loud in the Starbucks. <laughs> you know, you know, like when you're in a space and like the, the ambient room noise is like pretty loud and then it just goes Brum. Oh, well, the great news is from that, aside from the fact her going red and me just giggling <laughs> endlessly because I thought it was the cutest thing in the world. After I was done the reveal, somebody had actually hung around and came up to me after and said, okay, I got to ask what do you do? <laughs> Booked her on the spot. And, but that's, that's, the, that's the great thing that I get, right? Um, because I change how people see themselves. That's what I do. I'm, yeah, I take pictures, but I change how people see themselves. Um, but on my website, I gotta be so careful with how I, who I portray with that. As a boudoir photographer, honestly, I can tell you that I probably have the world's greatest portfolio I am not allowed to show. It is so frustrating. I mean, I look at wedding photographers and they're like, click, 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 awesome pictures, tag this person, the bridegroom on Facebook, all the people at the wedding on Facebook, and then they just virally spread everything. I don't get that luxury. I can't, eat, I, like, if I post a picture and it has someone's face in it, I have to get approval for it. Right? Like I can use stuff where it's unidentifiable and cropped, but there's only so much of that. But I have to be careful with who I show. If, if my clients look like anybody else on the street, I can't put models in my portfolio. Like, yeah, I can bring in model friends of mine. Like this person on the slide is a model friend of mine. She's really curvy. She's gorgeous. She rocks her curves like amazingly. But you know, she's not a small girl but she's beautiful. And this is what I need to show to my, custom, my potential customers, that anybody can do this, right? So you have to think about who your customer is and show them an image that they wanna see. Too often you're gonna get up in your own head and you're gonna shoot something that's technically perfect and would be there almost to impress other photographers in a way. I want you to shoot stuff that will impress your customers and to heck with the other photographers. Shoot what they want to see. And I promise you that'll help you resonate with them and that'll make your site into one of those things where they go, yeah, that person, that's who I want photographing this job. All right? Let's go to the next point here. Ah, oh, good old branding. And you know, those of you that do know what I do, you've probably seen that couch in a lot of shots. Um, it's this fancy old yellow couch. I got it, I found a guy on Kijiji who was selling it. Um, phew, the thing's probably about 100 years old. Every nick, scratch, stain, rip, tear, it's all my fault. I mean, I picked it up in immaculate condition and um, you know, it's, it's become pretty iconic with a lot of the shots that I do. Now I have other couches in there, but that's just the first one. So I mean, I, when I put branding on there, it, it actually becomes part of my brand. People come in and say, I want to shoot on the yellow couch. I go, I got a pink one too. I got a green one, a red one. And they're like, hmm, okay, but I really want to shoot on the yellow one. So like, it's just become that thing that is part of my business. Um, I've got a logo. It's the same logo that goes on the site as goes on all my boxes, on you know, my books. They, normally my logo, this is, a, this is my sample album. Um, logo doesn't go on the front of my books for a customer. It'll end up on the back page here in a black foil emboss. Costs me more to do, don't care. Helps brand my business. So there's no way that if she ever showed, if a client ever showed this book to one of her girlfriends, that she would ever be able to forget who did this for her. 
I mean, I don't think she'd be able to forget anyway, but assuming she's like, oh, what was the business name? It's right there, it's right there, okay? It's on everything. I mean, my price guide's got it. I mean, even my smaller block albums, it's, it's on the back. It, it's like, it's always there. It's, it's in as many places as I can get. I mean, I see you wearing Magic Vision Photography. You're just wearing the shirt. You wear it every day or? Yep. Yeah, why not? You know, people put this stuff on their cars. I'm looking into that right now. Um, you gotta, it's a way of marketing and branding yourself. And remember, you are your brand. Your brand is you. I read this great book. It's called Blogging Brilliantly. Um, it, I can't tell you who, who uh, wrote it off the top of my head. It's on Amazon. Just, just go search Blogging Brilliantly. But she makes a few really, really, really good points in the sense that she says, like, listen, like, be genuine and authentic with the way you blog and the way you talk about your business. I mean, I love what I do. It's changing how someone sees themselves is amazing. You know, when I got into this, um, it was by accident. I didn't know I wanted to be a boudoir photographer. I thought I wanted to be an actor headshot photographer. And I just had a client, came in, she's like, uh, could you do this for me? I mean, I'm, she's, I presume mid 40s, coming out of a long-term relationship, wasn't feeling so hot, wanted to do this. And I'm like, okay, sure, let's, yes, I guess, <laughs> you know? Did it, had no idea how hard it was to pose people in their underwear. Holy crap! And I'm like, oh man. So that, that was a learning experience. I would never show anyone those pictures if they paid me. Um, she loved them to death. She was like tearing up at the end, and I mean, she walked in like all kind of, at the reveal. She was kind of like, I don't know whether I do. She walked out like bouncing up and down. She couldn't. You could. You could have said the most vile thing to her, and you couldn't have wiped that smile off her face. And that's when I knew. This is exactly what I want to do, all right? That's why I got into this genre. I mean, boudoir is dominated by women, and like, I get it. Um, I'm a guy, and it's a little abnormal, but I guess the bonus is now, I know more about women's underwear than most women do, so. <laughs> um, but you know, when I blog and I talk about things like this, I'm very genuine, I'm open, I'm up front. I say, I'm a guy. Look, I love what I do. Here's how I got into this. And, you know, the branding is, you, you gotta stay true to your brand. You, 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 gotta be, you gotta be your brand. You truly do. And whether that be wearing a shirt all the time that says whatever your business name is on it, or just telling people your story, or just anything, you've got to be like, I love what I do, and this is what I do. And I, and I tell people like, like, listen, I could say I'm a boudoir photographer, or I could say, um, I change how people see themselves, and I basically make everybody look like they belong on the cover of a magazine. Right? That's what I do. I, I used to say I'm kind of a therapist with a camera. Um, it's, it, it's like, that, that's what I do, and I have my little ways of saying that. But ultimately, you gotta brand yourself. And that's why I think, you know, um, Tying back to GTA for a second, you know, like the fact that they can laser engrave all sorts of things, whether that be USB keys or different cover materials and things like that, or emboss it. Like you can give yourself a lot of extra oomph and credibility by having something that's like, although it, yes, as I said, it costs me more to emboss stuff on every book, but who cares? It makes, it just, it ups my game makes me look more like the luxury brand, which is what I want to be. I don't want to be the, the person who's just churning through people over and over and over and over again. I don't, I, I'd rather shoot four jobs a month than 20. But let's quantify that. Four jobs a month at say $2,000 each versus 20 jobs at 100. You know, like I, I, don't, I don't see the prize to that. Like just because I'm always busy doesn't mean I'm successful. Right? So let's go to the next point here. So I want you guys, if you haven't really defined that specialty, I want you to think about it. And I think after you do that customer exercise, this might, you might even, you know, like if you're, if you're a portrait photographer, you might actually, ref, you might even refine your portrait business, just, just a touch. Like you might, instead of saying, I take portraits of people, I, you might want to say like, 
I specialize in like uh, couples photography or I specialize in um, pet portraits or just like I'm just throwing things out there for portraits but you know like I want you to think long and hard about what it is you do and tie those two things together the brand on this side and the, the people on this side and uh, sorry and uh, yeah the, the customer on this side that's ultimately what I want you guys to do and think about long and hard I mean this should not be something you sit down and you spend a half an hour on this should be something you sit down and you, you think about long and hard. And I am constantly testing to see if those customer profiles still match the people I'm booking. This is where this analysis comes in. Remember I said at the start, like one of the jobs you have to be is you know, the one thing you got to be as an analyst. This is me analyzing all the time and trying to refine my business, but not maybe not even refine. Refine might not be the right word. Evolving my business might be a better way of putting it. And if you do that, you're going to start seeing some long-term success. And just out of curiosity, how long does it usually take to get a business to really go? Five years. Five years usually, right? It's going to take a while. If you, you know, hit the ground, you hit the ground running and you have a lot of steam and you have the right kind of training behind you, you know, hey, you know what? Maybe you get going in three. But reality is five because there's a lot of investment at the front end, because um, photography, the investment may not be the camera. It's probably gonna be all the learning, the trial and error, the marketing, the, all that kind of stuff that goes into the initial investment. And then you start building a little bit of steam, you start getting those referrals, you start attracting new business, and then that snowball just keeps growing. But it's gonna take you a little bit of time, so you gotta be perfectly willing to put in Three years of, maybe I'll call it agony, all right? You know, like self-doubt, you know, things like that to get yourself rolling. Because if this is the job you really want, you're going to find out within certainly the first year, if not the second, if this is something you want to stick to. And if it is something you want to stick to, you'll know because you're going to like, this is, this is what I want to do. And I can see the, the things coming. Like I'm, now that I've been doing this for long enough, I'm starting to see the reward and I'm start thinking about hiring extra people, bringing other things on board, doing outsourcing other jobs. Like, so I work less, but I've, I've got to have the financial capital to do it. So there's, you got to spend a little bit of time, but I'm, I'm hoping that with a few of these little tips, you can get there a little faster. All right. So what I want to do is I want to do a 10 minute break and uh, we're going to come back to the live stream in 10 minutes. And then um, we'll finish off with uh, some pricing ideas, okay?
Okay, so let's bring it back. Let's also get to that next slide because I want to talk about a pretty important thing. We call pricing. Yeah, everybody, everybody loves pricing. That's for sure. Um, now, we obviously know who our customer is, so the main thing is we can certainly um, figure out what to sell to them. I mean, if you're dealing with you know, family portraiture, well, there's a whole bunch of finished options you can, you can go with. Um, but ultimately, you're going to need to develop a price list for the genre of photography you're dealing with. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of package pricing. I've, I've tried both. I mean, I've tried the a la carte mode and I've tried the package pricing. And I've got to tell you, I've found way more success with packages than I have a la carte. And I'll talk about that in a little bit in just a sec. But um, for the next little bit of pricing, I'm going to focus a little bit more on business to consumer rather than business to business. So if you guys have business to business questions, you know, kind of stop me at the end and I'll tell you what I can about that. I primarily deal business to consumer, so end customer. That's, that's probably what I do better part of 95% of all the things I sell. I have a few businesses I deal with, but that's not really what I do. So um, pricing itself, I could probably do a two hour talk on pricing easily. And if you guys want that, talk to Andy and maybe tell him, hey, let's do a pricing one. Um, but I'm going to talk as much as I can about pricing in terms of the strategy towards being a successful business. So I'm going to put it in that context for this. So let's, let's look at the next point. And this is the thing that, well, to be honest, drives me nuts, is being the cheapest possible photographer out there. Um, I think this is the crutch that a lot of new photographers who want to start charging for their work uh, start using because they haven't identified a customer, they haven't necessarily nailed a genre, so they just go, well the only way I can sell is just to be the po cheapest possible kid on the block. And that is a recipe for disaster every day of the week. You are never going to make any money at this. You are going to shoot and burn. And the burn used to be for burning CDs, but also burn out. Because you're you might be working a ton, but you're not making any money. And that's why the right pricing and thinking about how you're going to arrive at what you should sell is important. If you don't have the right pricing strategy or ability to kind of add on to a package or add on a la carte and do things this way, you're going to find that we're going to have problems with this. Um, I just got a couple notes here that I want to... Oh yes. Um, do you think... Uh, I think the, the main thing is, is that if you're not speaking to, your, to the right customer, a lot of people make the, I guess, assumption that um, they, have to, they have to be the lowest possible price to attract people. And I also hear customer, uh, photographers saying, oh, none of my customers are willing to spend $2,000 on blah, 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 or they're never gonna, they're never gonna, they're not, they're never gonna buy an album for thousand dollars or or spend a thousand dollars for me to go to this thing or that thing well yeah they're you're right because you've got the wrong customer it's as simple as that if your marketing pitch is I'm the cheapest possible price for photography who do you think you're going to attract the cheapest possible person on the planet. <laughs> it's a fact. So don't think that being the cheapest is a means to garnering a tremendous amount of success. So you can offer a discount or a sale in order to get people into your little stream here. Maybe you knock some money off for a 
a, a referral package or something, but you've got to have some kind of meaningful value to your product. I mean, one of my strategies for packages is I have an A, B, C, D package, right? Uh, top end package is $21.55, entry level package is $5.95, and there's two points in between. I used to have three. So what, end, what ended up happening is I sold a lot of my second tier package, which is around 900 bucks, um, and not a lot of the top one. When I put in the really high one, the third one started selling for $1,500 a lot more, right? Because it wasn't the most expensive. They, it's a psychological thing. I read a lot of books on the psychology of selling. I love them. They're fun. Um, you know, uh, there's a great one called Predictably Irrational. I love that book. Um, not necessarily all related to sales, but you can read it and you can go, oh, that's an interesting social experiment, and I can see how I could apply that to selling. I used to train sales in a previous corporate life, and I loved reading stuff like that because I would try to help people selling cameras try to sell more cameras because that ultimately is what the company wanted to do. Predictably Irrational was the book title. So check it out. I mean, that's the first one I can think of off the top of my head, but I'm not saying that's the only one. So let's look at the next, uh, next point here. So you gotta be irresistible. And by irresistible, I mean you gotta be that place that people just go, whoa, that work is good, I want to be photographed by that person, I want them shooting my products, I want whatever the case may be. I want that one. You know what, like when you're, um, I don't know, shopping for something, and you're out there like, I don't know, maybe for some people it's shoes, some people it's electronic <coughs> gear, sometimes it's cameras, you just like, yeah, gear acquisition syndrome, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, ooh, shiny, I like that one. Um, right, like Fuji launches the GFX and I go, I want three, but you know, I can't have three, so I'll get one. But anyway, um, you wanna be that irresistible product because it resonates, like you resonate with that customer and they go, I really want that person. Now, if they look at you as being a specialist and somebody that is in line with the way they think, you are irresistible to them, and they will find a way to make things work price-wise. So don't be afraid of not, like I've had this argument with somebody where, you know, like, okay, well, I should charge like $3,000 for this book. Um, no, um, you gotta be within reason, right? Like there's pie in the sky, irresistible, and then there's reality, irresistible. And you need to look at who else in your industry that, you look like, or your genre of photography, I shouldn't say industry, because we're all in the photographic industry. But you know, you, you look at who your competition is and where are they priced. And you don't look at the bottom feeder competition. I'm not, I'm, not look, I'm not asking you to look at them. Look at them for a matter of context, so you know what everyone's doing. But look at people that you look at and you go, wow, that work is really strong. And when you get up into like that, that good level of photographers, you can instantly identify differences in people. Like you can see shooting style differences and all this kind of stuff. I want you to look at them, right? And I wanna look at, and you can try and ask them for prices. If they put prices on their website, you know, find out. I mean, I've had other photographers message me and ask about pricing. And I've said, here, here's my price list. I don't, really don't care, right? Like, there's really nothing to hide. I don't post my prices on my website because I don't want customers to instantly get sticker shock. Because I am not cheap. I am, I would, I might be one of the priciest people, but I might not be like the priciest person. But I am right up there at the top. And I do have a $600 package for somebody who wants to get started. I do mini sessions as well for people who want to get started, but ultimately, I am not going to be the cheapest kid on the block, ever. There are ways to save some money with me, by, but by having higher prices, I can afford to offer those discounts without burning a hole in my pocket. So you gotta be, you gotta be that thing that people go to. And I should point out that little thing that saves money, 
um, it's a, been a great sales tool for me because for somebody who has like this problem of like, oh, I don't know, you're really expensive. I really love your stuff, but I can't afford it. I have like a canned response in my client management software that I can shoot back to them saying, here's two different ways to save. And also I offer payment plans, right? So like I can overcome that objection right, left and center. And I say, I, wanna, I want you to come in. I want you to be a customer. I, I know I'm not. I know I'm not the least the, the, the cheapest person out there. I get that. But you love, you, con you reached out and contacted me because you love the work and you could see yourself with me photographing you in this, in this context. So let's make it happen. Let's try to make this work. You know, sometimes for some people I also do model calls where I do get to use full rights to their images. And if they're not cool with that, well, you can't save the money. But if you are cool with that, it gives me great portfolio material. So I got ways around that. I got ways for people to save. But what facilitates that is, a, is not being the cheapest product out there, right? It all goes into the grand scheme of things. And there are other photographers who do exactly what I do, who are a third the price. Don't care. I'm not competing with them. I'm trying to earn my customers' businesses, my customers' business. And those other businesses, well, if they choose to go with them, Hope you have a great session. If you want to come back in five years because it didn't work out the right way, come back and see me. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, for every 10 inquiries I get, I book one or two. And I'm okay with that. You know, some people don't realize I'm a guy and they're not comfortable with a guy shooting them in their underwear. I get that. I'm okay with that. It used to really, really, really irk me. Because I'm not, I'm not that pervy guy with a camera. I'm not that dude. Come on. <sighs> I'm not that dude. Seriously. I just, you know, but, you know, the perception can be there. And I respect that. That's their call. I want, I want everybody to be comfortable in my studio. And I set it up so that it is a professional studio. It's, I have a whole team of female assistants, makeup artists and stuff. So everybody's, like, I'm the only guy there. And, but ultimately, I want to I wanna make people feel awesome. And... You know, if I can get them in the studio, amazing. But don't feel like you have to book every single lead you get. You may, want to, you may want to make sure you're following up properly on every lead you get. That's where client management software comes in really handy. Ah, but I digress. So that's being irresistible. Let's, let's look at the next point I got here. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about costs before we talk about pricing. And I'm just going to use fictitious like numbers. I just rounded stuff up. I, I just wanted easy math, OK? So here's, I, I break down costs into two categories. I have my fixed operating costs. On one side, that's my these things, studio rent, marketing, cell phone, et cetera. This is stuff I can predictably say is going to be an expense for me every single month. It's consistent. They're fixed. They don't change. I mean, my cell phone bill may go up and down a little bit, but by and large, it's this price, right? So that's fixed costs. And everybody's going to be a little bit different. I mean, I shoot out of a studio. Um, I don't know whether everybody else shoots out of studios, has their own space or not. Doesn't matter, but some people are going to have different things. But a few things that you're definitely going to want to have on fixed cost. Um, I put studio rent because it's kind of like the top of the list for me because it's very expensive. Um, next one on that list is marketing. If you don't have marketing factored into your fixed costs, stop what you're doing now and go back to your nine to five. You have to spend money to make money. And I'm not saying it's got to be 500 bucks all the time. You got a question in the front and then a question on the online. Uh, first question is, I noticed that, do you keep your living expenses separate from your business expenses? Yeah, the question is, do I keep my living expenses separate from my business expenses? Oh my God, yes. I have a separate business checking account and credit card and I have my personal expenses over here where I buy all sorts of weird stuff, okay? <laughs> like. The business and the, the only time the business interacts with the personal account is when I pay myself. That is the only time that those two accounts ever mingle. All right? You, 
if you want to be successful and you want to be able to track and analyze, separate them. How, you, how do you determine how, how, what you're going to pay yourself? Like, well, <laughs> the question is, how do I determine what will I pay myself? Well, that's a, that's a simpler question or simpler answer than you might think. Well, depends on how much I made. All right? Like I could say, okay, I'm gonna, spend, I'm gonna pay myself $3,000 every single month, but if I didn't make enough to pay myself $3,000 this month, like in pff, February, March, which are my slowest months, well, then I'm not paying myself $3,000, right? So, you know, is it sort of consistent? Yeah, but I, I do have months that go like this, right? Like I do have ups so and down months, so it, it is definitely a variable income. And for those of you who are interested in becoming a, an entrepreneur and a, a photographer, stop getting used to the regular paycheck. <laughs> it doesn't exist, <laughs> right? When you work for yourself, you're victim of your own success, basically, whether that be good or bad. And what was the question in the uh, online? What studio management software do you use, Trevor? Oh, so studio management software. I use a great software called Tave, T-A-V-E. You can go to Tave.com and uh, they are basically uh, like, a, I mean, I'll drop fixed costs for just a second here, but uh, client management software is what I use for booking, model agreement or client agreements, um, keeping me on track, like for scheduling, emailing makeup artists for like when they have to come in for this job that I book them for, um, directions to my studio for the clients, um, lead tracking, like how, how many emails have I sent to this person, canned response emails, automation basically. For what boils down to about 15 or 20 bucks a month for me, I have a personal assistant. I can't screw up. Before this, trying to track like, oh, have I emailed that person about this? And you know, you kind of put people in a spreadsheet or flag them, put them in folders and oh my God. Like I was, I found I've booked you know, probably 20% more of those leads just by having a client management software because I can stay on top of things. Um, flat out, best investment I ever made. <laughs> and I don't care whether you just have a few inquiries coming in, it's really helpful. Um, and then getting everything all set up, it's painful because you gotta do a lot of work, but now I have automated stuff, like it automatically sends clients <laughs> reminders. I don't have to worry about it. So a week before their session, um, sends out a reminder saying, hey, your session's in a week. Just remember, these are some of the things you'll want to do to prepare. Day before, here's the directions to the studio. The second they sign the client agreement and I countersign, it automatically sends them a prep guide, a thank you, and one other thing I'm forgetting, but it sends it to them. Um, but it's, it's like, it's automated. I love automation. Like, computers are awesome, but we shouldn't be a slave to them. So that's why I have client management software. Okay, so do you have a question? Yeah, because um, I'm just trying to get around the fixed co your business costs, mm -hmm. your personal costs, because the way I kind of calculate it is I wanted to cover my personal costs so I can use my business to live. Right, so you, the question is you, you combine the two because you want to have your business eventually pay for your personal costs. Right. Um, no, I am not an accountant. I hate accounting. Like, believe me, I hate accounting. There's nothing more that I would rather do less than accounting. But I will tell you that if you set yourself up so that you have your business, it generates whatever profit and then you pay yourself from that. Not only is it easier to figure out what's going on there, but you can also start writing stuff off. So like part of your rent or mortgage can be written off through the business and then your cell phone can be doing, done the same way. Like you want to keep it separate. I understand that. But my question is how, if you don't include your living costs, to your calculations to, for your pricing, how do you then figure out how much you need to charge to cover your living expenses as well as your business expenses? Okay, so the question is, is like, how do I cover my living expenses in, a, like, in addition to this? Well, I'm gonna get a little calculator up on screen, and it's gonna be like, hmm, it'll be a rough idea generator of like, what do I want to make? Because just in, just in the regular nine to five world, you got paid an amount, right? Like let's say you got paid for mathematically simple purposes, you got paid $4,000 a month, right? You know that you have, uh, like that was, let's just pretend 
That was your business profit that you made. So that $4,000 goes over to you and then you whittle your living expenses out of that. But if you only made $2,000, your living expenses obviously have to change according to that. And that's where the, that's where the difference is. So um, yeah, you, you gotta, I really think the separation and then just basically saying, okay, I have this much money to pay myself at the end is a much better strategy than trying to calculate all your living expenses and then try to make your business wrap around that. Okay. Um, so, was, I think somebody else had their hand up. Yes, no? no I was just uh, curious, because you talk about MailChimp and other things, does that go under the marketing budget? or? How no, uh, well the question is like, I have other things, like I mentioned MailChimp. Yeah, it's uh, email, there it is. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, no. I put that email the in email as my, your yeah, my, it's my email, like it's my at provocateurimages.ca. Exactly. Book me at provocateurimages.ca. I do that through a G Suite. By the way, little known fact, Google announced this thing that if you don't want to pay your web host for a stupid exchange server, which costs you like a hundred and like 40 bucks a year, right? Like just stupid amounts of money you can basically get Google to tie into your some back-end techie nerd thing and it just basically takes your domain name and just and it just it just goes through Gmail yeah. instead of the web host yeah. so yeah. and I pay five bucks a month for that yes yeah. <laughs> like save myself a hundred bucks you can actually right? customize it put your logo on there and yeah have employees per employee it's gonna charge only five bucks because um you know what looks really unprofessional when you're emailing people like provocateurimages at gmail.com. That would be unprofessional. So for those of you that have a domain, and also uh, a website is not at flickr.com, okay? Like you need something, and if you're, you know, like Squarespace or, oh man, Wic. Photo shelter. like any of these things, if you can just get your domain and they can kind of make the site look all pretty, great, do it, but just don't send them to a site that looks like you're a fly-by-night, right? You, it's tough to validate pricing, like that's expensive, when you're not looking the part. So, uh, so let me see what else in here. Yeah, so like there's, there's a whole bunch of things, but you asked like, you know, is MailChimp in there? No, MailChimp is not there. I just kind of grabbed a few off okay. the top of my head. Th this is, these are totally fictitious numbers, um, but you know, like I, I basically have all this stuff in here. The important one is marketing. The other important one is, Things like upgrades, miscellaneous, and gear fund. Now gear fund, I just basically say is, I, I put $250 into an investment savings account every month, and sometimes more if I have a little bit more, and it, the money just sits there. It earns a little bit of interest, and if I need to go buy, pff, like that Fuji GFX, <laughs> wish list. <laughs> um, actually, I, maybe, like short of starting a Kickstarter for you to buy me that camera, um, I got to set aside some money, right? So um, I put that, I factor that into my fixed costs. Like just if I wanted to um, also siphon something off uh, for taxes, like if I want to say every month I want to put away, I don't know, a thousand dollars for tax, right? Like I could put that in a TFSA too and it'll earn a little bit of interest and when tax season comes, I'm not going, oh my God, I gotta come up with six grand somewhere or I'm gonna end up with late charges. You wanna get audited? That's a great way to do it. Don't pay the CRA, okay? So you might wanna put that kind of stuff aside too. Just, but just like those are some of the fixed costs that you might wanna factor in. So let's go to the next thing, which is session costs. Now session costs are a little bit different. So you notice that one of the line items that was in fixed costs is, was not there, and that was album production. Now I do, some months I'll do four books, because so, I mean, let, honestly, most of my business is I do books and image boxes and things like that. I don't, I don't, I don't like, like, oh, here, have some images on a USB key. I very rarely do that. <laughs> I don't like doing that. I mean, for the odd customer, I do do it because that's what they want, so fine, okay. Um, but I, 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 like, guys, these things are awesome. There's good margin here, right? This is how you do four sessions a month versus 14, right? For much lower money. 
So um, session costs are specific to a given session. So I'm looking at this on a per job basis. So customer <laughs> X comes in and you know, like I maybe have some gear rental if it was a, maybe a commercial job, I had to go outside, got to rent a few more lights or I don't know, like there may be gear rental. I'm not saying these are always included, but these are just some examples. So I might have a second shooter, an assistant if I'm a wedding photographer, or even if I just want to have an assistant at my studio because I got a big job, I got a whole bunch of people, I might have to factor the f in that I have an assistant that day and I have to pay them. Um, hair and makeup pretty much happens almost every single shoot with me. That's my business. That probably isn't your business, right? It's just, I, seriously, I don't want more work in post-production. So I bring in hair and makeup because it helps a lot, all right? Uh, there's nothing better than even skin tones to start with. You know, and false lashes. I don't really have a thing for false lashes. Like if I went out to a bar and I was you know, looking to date someone and she had false lashes on, I might go, meh. But in the boudoir studio, that's non-negotiable, kids. Those false lashes are going on you because they look amazing in photographs. So, I mean, I need hair and makeup. Um, yeah. You mentioned marking up products and, and all the other stuff. Your hair and makeup, you marked that up? Question is, do I mark up my hair and makeup? No. Okay. I, I generally don't. I, um, depending on the hair and makeup artist I use, I have the one of the top people I use is $150, and a couple of the other ones are a little less. So some are 130 and some of them are 120 okay. So in some cases, yeah, I do make a little bit more, but I don't intentionally mark it up. Okay. So I kind of price it as to the, what the max could be. All right, just because, yeah, I cover, I cover my butt, so I don't end up losing money. Um, okay, so then there's book production, and then a branded USB key. Uh, where'd that go? This isn't mine, but I saw one of these. Like, <coughs> so, like, GTA makes these fancy little boxes. Um, look, <laughs> like, customized to, like, this person's wedding. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty cool. And then this cool little laser engraved wood USB key. Once again, not mine, but, woo, USB key. Wicked, right? Um, the eh, cost on these usually is about 15-ish dollars, depending on, you know, which box you get, which finish you get. But for me, anyway, they're about 15 bucks. So for certain packages where some low-res digital images are included, there was a key word in there. What was the word? Can everybody say it? Low-res. Thank you. God, I just... <sighs> you don't get high-res images. You ever heard of licensing? Yeah, right, okay. When you buy a digital image from me, you get a licensed image. To the customer, they go, I get a picture. No, you get a licensed image, meaning you can reproduce this. I'm giving you the print license to go print this up to an eight by 10. But if you want to make beautiful wall art, sorry kids. You're not getting that for free, okay? Please do that, please. <laughs> Don't give away digital images. They're not for free, okay? Good. So anyway, I got these brand new USB keys. So these are my session costs. Now, I made a note over here on the side that says you should probably aim for about 75 to 80% gross profit on the actual products and 65% on the packages because I do discount the packages to make people want to spend more money. So there's an advantage versus going a la carte. If you want to go a la carte, I might work out a little bit of a deal for somebody a little bit, but generally speaking, that's your more expensive route and you can do with it what you want. But also all of my packages have this great upgrade path and they're just suggestions. You can customize them if you want and we'll talk about it. But ultimately when I have my price list, haha, this thing, um, once again, uh, I'm going to shamelessly plug GTA once again. So this is a little price menu book. Now, this is absolute genius because I can take out the sheets. All right? You just, put a, you just order new 8x10 prints and you put them in. So if you realize, like, you know, you got a typo in there or you're like, ah, oh, I need to charge more money, you just print a new sheet. Done. Oh, look, it's branded. 
right? So with my session costs, I'm looking at just trying to figure out what this session is going to cost. I want to know how profitable the session is. Now, one of the benefits that people get when they take my business mentoring program is I give them a template for developing an a la carte price menu. So you can basically add all your line items and then you can just add the products you want. It'll give you a customer total, what your gross profit percentage is for each product, but also on the overall sale, how, much, how many dollars you're making on the sale, allow you to enter discounts. It's like this magical little calculator and it is awesome. And it's how I, I, I figure out whether my package price is too rich or not rich enough. Can I hit this price point if I want to put together this special package or not? Um, like if there's a sale on here at the lab and they're offering, uh, I think May's promo is 25% off the books, the Renzo books, right? Um, you know, like there's, there's stuff to be done there. So I might, fa I might work out a promo where if you, get, if you shoot in May and you get a book in May, I can offer you a little more, right? Because my costs went down. So, question? So when you're presenting your package price to a client, are most of these prices hidden? Meaning that like the makeup artist is part of the uh, package and so on? Um, so let's just do this. So I have my packages. I know, I know internet land, you can't see this. I'm going to try and explain this as best I can. So I have my radiate, seduce, captivate, and allure package. Pricing is there. And this little chart basically shows them what they get. So yeah, they do get a one hour session, extra hours, 95 bucks. You get two to three looks, professional may, hair and makeup. It's included for all four of them. Uh, included finished products are listed here. Number of pages in the album, if applicable, album upgrade sizes, like everything's listed here. Got it. All right. So I list, I do list everything out. I don't just say package X, $400, right? Like it's, it's going to be a lot more in depth than that. Because I've seen some places where they, you know, they charge like so much for shooting mm -hmm. and so much for makeup art. So some, it's kind of like an a la carte. Like the question is, is like you've seen people who do this um, where they charge per the session, then there's like all these add-ons, right? So yes, we can do the add-on or a la carte mode too. Because I'm thinking that, you know, if I'm a client and I had a choice to not have a makeup artist, I may not choose to not have a makeup artist. Right. And then I would make the <coughs> Yeah, so you could, you, could, you could subtract things, like you basically said you could, or in essence, you could subtract things from your product, from your package. And I do that all the time. There are times where people say, ah, I don't really need a makeup artist, or my, my best friend's a makeup artist. I cringe a little bit, because I usually know they're not as good as my people, but if they're trying to save 100 bucks, go nuts. But notice I only knock 100 off that instead of 150. Right. Uh, so I make an extra 50 bucks on that. So it's, it's actually worth my while. Um, so what I want to do is I want to do a quick little exercise and I want to show you this basic calculator just to, just to kind of illustrate a point. Um, now this little calculator, uh, can we flick, flip over to Chrome for a second? Ta-da! Haha, <laughs> here we go. Technology is awesome. All right, so here's what I got in here. We've got basically a fictitious business. And um, uh, Mike, you'll definitely want to leave uh, the live people on the spreadsheet while I talk. So um, we can put in fixed costs. Let's just pretend our fixed costs are $550 a month. These numbers aren't necessarily supposed to be real. I'm just, I'm just trying to get you thinking a certain way, okay? So um, basically it would cost us, whoops, if we had, uh, you know, didn't sell anything. Um, basically, we'd, we'd need to make about $6,600 annually just, just to break even in sales, right? But we're obviously, we're just in at $550. Um, that's basically our, we're negative 550 in profit right now. So I just want you to look at those package one, two, three, and four. And I just, I, uh, I have these set up such that um, just going to check here. Yeah, I'm making 60% gross profit on each package. I, I get it. Look, I know for everybody this is going to be different. Just 
go with me that 60 points is my calculation, okay? So I'm making, I sell it for 500. If I'm making 60% of that as profit, because the other $200 goes into, I don't know, makeup artist, book production, what, whatever the, the session cost may be, the profit is $300, okay? So that's where we're going with this. So if we sold, I don't know, let's say four of these little things a month, Welcome to the poverty line, okay? Ha <laughs> ha, yes. Um, you certainly won't be buying the cheapest million dollar house in Toronto on that annual salary of $24,000. <laughs> you might be able to buy someone's dog house in the backyard. Parking yeah, parking, uh, park, oh, geez, that's, that might even be much, yeah. <laughs> might not even get a parking spot as the comment was. So. I'm just using this because I have package one at $500. Now, when you go through and you create your a la carte price menu, and then you go through and you create some, a few packages, what I want you to do is I want you to basically take, you can take those numbers and you put them into a simple calculator like this. Like, look, I'm not doing any ridiculous math here. Um, package one, there's a quantity of four. I multiplied four by 300, I get $1,200. Um, and the sales per month, the far right column, um, that's basically, you know, like four times $500, there's my sales. Because there's a lot of, I, I, it drives me nuts. Sometimes out there, I've seen other photographers who are offer, offering a business training, and they're basically saying, hey, you know what, like it's six figure photography. Like, oh, okay, you make six figures in sales, show me six figures in profit, right? So just remember that. Uh, taxes. Taxes, I'm staying out of taxes for now. These are, these are pre-tax prices for right now, and a business taxes haven't enough factoring that in right now. I just wanna, I just wanna show you what I like, you know, like you're used to the nine to five, I made $45,000 a year, right? Like I'm just trying to put it in equal apples to apples comparison. So anyway, so if you sell only $500 packages, you, my friends, are in trouble. Yes, you're turning a profit, but this ain't much of a profit. And I want you to think like, okay, so well, what if I did, um, what if I just did eight, wet, eight things instead? It has to be realistic for what you're doing. Now I'll use weddings as an example. Um, how many weddings can you shoot per month? Real number. Four. Why only four? So you can only shoot four? No, you can shoot eight. You can shoot eight. Well, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, there's those, those weird people that have Friday weddings. I don't understand. I don't ever want to go to a Friday wedding. There's some multiple weddings. You know, like, okay. So, but anyway, you might, you might have a few Fridays, I but... I don't care about the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you're, when you're photographing them, you don't care about the day. You're right. Um, but uh, there, there is a ceiling to how much how, or how many of those you can do. Just as like, okay, I could do... You know, I could lower my sell price for headshots and maybe 150 bucks, but you know, I can only do so many of those before I just literally burn out and I spend more time editing and stuff. So there is a theoretical maximum to this. So I need you to, in the back of your mind for this little calculator, at least put that in your head. Um, but watch what happens if I start going like four on, uh, on like the thousand dollar package. Now all of a sudden I'm starting to be like, oh, okay, well that's not, that's not too bad, but if I do two of these and, you know, maybe two of these, and now all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I'm starting to get to some decent numbers. And I'm not saying 500, 750, 1,000, and $2,500 is the be all and end all. That might just be the package price. You, I hope, are still going to add on extra stuff to whatever, even if that $2,500 package. Right now, my most popular package is $1,500. It's a two hour session, hair and makeup, includes a, an eight by 10 book. This is a nine by 12, but it includes a book like this, material cover. It's, it's uh, you know, it's 1,500 bucks. But by the time I've added a whole bunch of stuff on through in-person sales, come check out the in-person sales workshop. <laughs> I'll teach you how, <laughs> right? By the time I've added that, like, I'm telling you, like I'm up at like $2,200, $2,300 and those add-ons, I'm not making 60 points on, I'm making 90 points on those. So they're almost all profit. 
right? So I'm just, I'm just making my life easy. So I mean, you start doing, like, I just want this calculator to show you, like, are these packages, if I just sold my package, could I, could I make the money I want to make? And this goes back to Lou's question earlier about, like, personal and business. Like, I want to figure out what I'm being paid. Well, this gives you an annual salary right there. All right, so it tells you and kind of puts you at least in the mindset of could I make this work? Like you can look at your current packages, plug them in here, and you'll kind of know how many of those you do a month and see if it makes sense. All right? So it's, um, it's a fun little exercise. It's just what I call a litmus test to your viability as a business. And it's, this is far from advanced math. Like I know on a Wednesday evening, this might be advanced math. But if you can add, subtract, and do a little bit of multiplication, that's all good. So um, let's flip back to the Prezo. And we'll go to the next slide. Ta-da. So here's what you guys need to do, your homework. Go home, and I want you to look at your pricing, because you're already going to be doing some homework of looking at your customer. I want you to look at your pricing in relation to that customer. And I want to make sure that you always factor in, to start at least, in an a la carte price menu. I always start off the first line item in that a la carte price menu. It's my session fee. It's 350 bucks for me. Now, if you're a wedding photographer, I don't know. If you're a portrait photographer, it's probably around the same price. You start off with, a, you start off with that session fee. You might have a, an extension for your one hour thing. I mean, heck, I'll look at my price list. What do I have? Because uh, I have it all laid out right here. So yeah, I got my one hour in-studio fee with hair and makeup, 350 bucks. Uh, session extension, 95. I have all my albums, the two different varieties, like the, uh, where is it? I got the block albums, and I got the material albums. Um, I've got photo boxes, I've got wall art, and I got prints on my price list. There are a few other things, but I don't necessarily put them on here because they don't apply to my customers. Okay, like, listen, there's like all these wicked accordion brag books and I don't know, like there's other, there's different styles of image boxes and there's different types of wall art that I, that I don't put on here. I have all the pricing for it, but the GTA has a huge price list. Don't put everything in there. Pick and choose the stuff that's relevant to your customer and then get samples. How are you going to sell anything if you don't have it to show? That was the first thing I learned selling cameras. If that camera ain't there, don't talk about it. Yeah, because it's a really uphill battle to try and sell something you can't show someone. All right, so don't do it. Um, don't give away too much with your packages, meaning allow yourself an upgrade path so that you can <laughs> say, here's the base package, but if you, you know, like I'll take my, um, my second tier package, 795, comes with a, five by five book, this is an eight by eight. If they want to upgrade to this size, which they all do, it's an extra 200 bucks. Difference in price at cost for me, 20 bucks-ish, maybe, maybe not even that much, all right? Not much. Difference to go from, where's an eight by 10? Ah, well there's an eight by 10 size. So an eight by 10 size to this size, Pricing a GTA, 15, 13, 17 bucks, something like that, 200 bucks. All right, you can kind of see that I, my add-ons are where I make my money. If you're not adding on to your sales, you are losing a ton of opportunity as well as money. So please join me for that in-person sales thing so I can teach you about how to upgrade stuff and how to show people stuff that they go, oh my God, I know your books come with 20 pages. I don't, I don't do 20 page books here. I do 40 page books, 50 page books, 60 page books. And none of my customers have a problem paying that. People who come in and say I have a budget of $500 will sometimes spend $1,500 or $2,000. You just gotta show them stuff that kicks ass. All right? So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide and wrap her up. So big thank you guys for coming out. I love the, I love the fact we broadcast this to uh, YouTube Live. Is there any uh, questions on the YouTube Live side of things? Okay, so no questions there. 
They seem to be chatting amongst themselves, which is awesome. But thank you guys for attending live. Thank you guys for attending in person. Um, I really hope you can make that uh, marketing your photography because that is all about marketing you, like getting out there, some ideas how to partner with businesses and partner with other people and, and just, you know, not necessarily spending money marketing, but finding ways of creatively marketing so you get those great little partnerships. And there's more as well, but that's, it. that's my favorite component to that. And then of course, in-person sales. For those of you that are not like doing business to customer type interaction, in-person sales is huge. Not as much in, like, as important in B2B, but when you're selling to customers, this is the way you will make more money. I can almost promise you, you're gonna make three to $400 more per sale doing in-person sales. It's easy to do. And I'll take you through how I do it. Um, so the, other, the only last point is, um, is like, I, I, as I said, I mentioned this, I do this business mentoring thing. If you'd like more info on it, just email me, info at photo training, and I will send you the complete info guide on uh, what I do and what it covers. It's so much more than what we just talked about today. Like this is just the tip of that iceberg. And then of course, big thanks to, uh, to GTA Imaging for hosting this and kind of helping make everybody a stronger photographer and making more money. And if you have more questions about products and stuff, please talk to Andy and Patricia. They will be more than happy to answer that. So thank you very much for attending, guys. Thank you.